Amen. All right. I want you to take note of this for history's sake. The last chapter of Hebrews. The last chapter of Hebrews. Did you ever write a note? And I know this is going to age lots of us. Did you ever truly write a note? You took a a piece of paper or a stationary card or something, and you wrote a note. You didn't text. you You didn't email. You wrote a note to someone. And as you were writing, you thought of other things that you wanted to say, but you were losing space. You were running out of space. You were running out of paper. And so you got smaller and smaller maybe in your print, and you started saying just the little things, and maybe you didn't put them all in sentences. You just did some bullet points or something like that. Uh, I remember a lot of notes back in the old days when I used to write notes to Dawn back in the old days. You know, I'd start out with big print, but then I'd think of more wonderful things about her that I wanted to say. And so I just kept on, and the print got smaller and smaller. Well, guess what? You get to chapter 13, and you start to read this, and it seems like the writer is running out of paper. And he realizes he's coming to the end, and he doesn't have much time, and he's got a lot on his mind to still say. And so it's a little bullet point after bullet point after bullet point. And you're thinking to yourself as you read this, does it even make sense? Does it tie together in any way, shape, or form? And I want you to say, I want to say, yes, it does. There is a method to his madness, and that's what I want to look at today. In fact, Hebrews is interesting. First part of Hebrews is doctrine. And you remember, many of you went, have gone through it. We learned about Jesus. We learned about angels. We learned about Satan. We learned about heaven and hell. We learned about the high priest. We learned about the sacrifices and the offerings and the tabernacle and the Old Testament ways. We learned about the law and the legal system. And it's as if now he's moving into that or has moved into that section and especially In chapter 13 where he says, okay, you've got all the doctrine in place. You've got all the facts in place. Now, apply it. Apply what you say you know. Apply what you've learned, if you would. And there's a huge lesson and reason behind it. And here it is, church. It's because if we're going to call ourselves believers, the writer of Hebrews would say, then live like a believer. If you're gonna if you're gonna claim you love Jesus then live like you love Jesus and this is so huge today church because so many people are rejecting us they're rejecting the church they're rejecting Jesus because they watch how we act not on a Sunday morning but how we act what we say what we think on a Monday to Saturday and there are many out there in the world who are falling away because of it The philosopher and atheist Bertrand Russell wrote an essay entitled, this is a good one, Why I Am Not a Christian. And he went through different reasons as to why he had not accepted the faith. And then his major reason was this. Because he had seen so many Christians who professed being Christians but lived nowhere like a Christian should be living. Sort of like, wasn't long after I began my ministry, I had a lady visit me, and this lady had a black eye, and I was very much surprised that this lady had a black eye, and she went on to tell me about the abuse that took place in the home. Her husband just continually abused her, verbally abused her, physically abused her, and she came in with this black eye, and it surprised me because I knew her husband, and her husband was one of these who You could meet him on the street, you could meet him anywhere, and it was all this, boy, I love Jesus, Jesus is my Lord, Jesus is my Savior, I just love Jesus. And yet what he was doing in the home, alone, with his wife, was anything but loving Jesus. Now I realize that people can look at me on a bad day, and you on a bad day, And they could rationalize, I don't like the church and I don't like Christians because they do what they do. But that doesn't lessen the responsibility you and I have to live like believers, church. Just because they say what they say doesn't mean we ought to stop doing what we're supposed to be doing, amen? In fact, we ought to do our best to prove people like this atheist Bertrand Russell wrong. We ought to do our best. Peter put it this way in 1 Peter, he said this, Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. 
Someone put it a little bit differently. They put it like this. They said, live in such a way outside of the church that if someone has to say something bad about you, they have to lie about you. They have to make it up. All right? John MacArthur tells about visiting a jail and doing his prison ministry, and he, he preached a sermon one night, and uh, this guy comes up to him afterwards and tells him what a great you know, preacher, what a great message this was, and how much it touched my heart, and blah, 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 blah. And John MacArthur says, so you're a Christian? And the guy says, yes, I'm a Christian. And he says, what are you in for? What are you here for? And the guy says, oh, I, I, I wrote 20, 30, or, and he said, I've had 20 or 30 traffic tickets that I didn't pay, so they put me in, and there were probably more to it, but he seemed kind of proud about what he had done. And John, John MacArthur looked at him, and he said this, would you do me a favor? Don't tell anybody you're a Christian. The guy looks at him, you know, like that. He says, just keep your mouth shut, because what you're doing is messing up the testimony for everybody else. Think about that. You ever live your life in such a way, making some messes that you were a bad testimony, truly, when people looked at you, maybe for that moment, you were just a bad testimony for the faith. I think we all are like that at times, and I think this is what the writer of Hebrews is getting at when he's looking at us as human beings, as just people out there on the street. If you're going to claim to follow Christ, then live like it. In front of people, at home, behind the scenes, out on the street, if you're going to claim Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then live like it. And so he spends the next little bit in this chapter telling us, here's how you live like it. Here's what you need to be doing. Here's how you need to be looking. So over the next several weeks, just to get you a little preview here, we're going to talk about relationships. We're going to talk about sex. We're going to talk about money. We're going to talk about politics. Oh, I think I've gotten your attention now, okay? So, let's start it. Hebrews 13, verses 1 through 3. Keep on loving each other as brothers. Don't forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. As I said before, writer of Hebrews has spent a good portion of this book describing the kind of faith that the kind of faith we should have in Christ, now he says, here's how to live it out. And first he says, basically, we have a responsibility towards others. A responsibility towards others. And I love this first line, keep on loving each other's brothers. How many of you have brothers? I'm not talking sisters because they are a different cre creature altogether, okay? In a good way, okay, but brothers. How many of you have brothers? All right, I have two brothers, a younger and older brother. And if it was anything dealing with this we did not live with regards to this scripture keep on loving each other as brothers our our our, our priority in life and still is to a point is to make his, each other's lives as miserable as possible i mean that was it you know we got on each other's nerves i mean we fought like cats and dogs still do in a fun loving way i mean honestly Here's your 53-year-old preacher. I go home sometimes. My brother and I are down on the floor wrestling, okay? It just, that's, the body's 53, the mind is still 17. But anyway, you know, I, in fact, uh, my brother was in college. I think it was his senior year in high school, his first year in college, that he bought a 1966 uh, Corvair car, a Corvair uh, Ralph Nader's favorite vehicle. But anyway, he restored that thing. It was a beautiful car. And he had put himself, he had put five paint jobs on this car, Bobby. I mean, he had done, and he had this thing parked in the shop. And one day I'm, I'm riding through with my bicycle. And I'm this bratty teenager who couldn't stand my brother at that point anyway. He's my older brother. And I just, you know, ugh. anyway, golden boy, couldn't do anything wrong. Anyway, yes, I do have problems. I ought to see a counselor about this. But. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm riding through the shop one day, and I, and I just happened to ride by his car, and it's parked between a pole, and here's the car, and it's not a long, you know, the gauntlet is there, and I ride through it, and I just happened to scratch his car a little bit, <laughs> happened to. That, that pedal on that bicycle went like that on his car, you know, just right down about this much of a section. And let me tell you right there, Treating each other in brotherly love was not high priority on our list that day, all right? He, he forgave me. I got up and had my teeth redone, but he forgave me, you know. 
But the older we've gotten, honestly, the older we've gotten, the more we've come to love each other. Because the more we've been through together, the more things we've done together. The writer of Hebrews knows this is exactly how family is supposed to be, even the family in the church. And he's writing to you guys, he's writing to the church back then, especially these guys 2,000 years ago, because they had been through so much. They were family, but they had been persecuted, they'd been through the strife, they know how to encourage one another, they know how to support one another, and he sees them coming together. And he doesn't say, I want you to begin loving each other. Look how the sentence goes. Keep on, keep on loving each other. Do it like family. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, preachers always say, I'm going to pull the Greek or the Hebrew out on you. I'm going to pull the Greek on you now, but you know Greek and you didn't know it. All right. You didn't realize, you know, Greek. What is the word for brotherly love in the Greek word for brotherly love? Philadelphia. Say you knew it, you know, Greek and you didn't even know it. Brothers and sisters in Christ, brotherly love, Philadelphia. Phileo, meaning to have an affection for one another. Adelphus is the other part of that uh, word. Brother from the same womb, or brother from the same mother, I guess you could say. In other words, here are brothers and sisters in Christ. And what does he mean by that? It means you've been born again. You've been born into the family of God if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. Therefore, you have the same father. All right, we have the same father. We're going in the same direction. He says, so treat each other like that. And he says, I know you're not going to always get along. He's, he's human beings. He's got to be. And he says, I know you're not going to get but treat it. Don't stop loving each other. What does he see? He sees these, these folks who are being persecuted, and some of them are running away from the faith. Some of them are thinking about, they're sitting there thinking, huh, I don't know if I want to stick in this family or not. I don't know if I want to follow Jesus or not. And the writer is saying, don't leave us. Don't do it. Don't split the family. Don't stop loving each other. Now, let's bring it up to right here, this room right now. You got peculiarities. You got quirks. I know you, okay? If you want to know what they are, ask me and tell me to be honest, and I will let you know your quirk and your peculiarity. I have none, and it's wonderful. No. I could ask you, and it wouldn't take but a second for you to label, here's here your, David, you know. But sometimes family gets on family's nerves. Amen? Whether it's outside the walls or inside the walls. We get on each other's nerves. Sometimes we hold grudges. Sometimes we don't forgive like we ought to forgive. Sometimes somebody says hello and they don't answer hello back. Sometimes you have to walk on eggshells around other believers. We all have our bad days and some people have more bad months. But we all have peculiarities. That's why I love the old poem we learned back in, I guess, seminary or something. But it's, it went like this. To live above with saints we love, oh, won't that be glory. But to live below with saints we know, that's a different story. All right? And there's a lot of truth to that. It's not easy to love everyone. But here the writer of Hebrews is saying, you want to be Christ out there on the street? You want to show somebody else who the lighthouse is? Then love one another. In fact, Jesus said it over in Matthew, or excuse me, in John chapter 13. Uh, Jesus said that this is the disciples' definition, if you would. If you've got your Bibles, turn over to John chapter 14. I'll pick that up later. John chapter 14. <laughs> Never mind, it's right there. Okay, let's do it this way. There it is. A new command I give you, love one another, he says. Love one another as I've loved you. All right? So you must love one another. And here's the definition of a disciple. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. In other words, we're in the same family. We talked about this in Hebrews. We're on the same team. We're going to the same place together. We're open. We ought not to try to, to turn others off because we turn each other off. I thank God, you know, for this place. Somebody asked, he said, he asked me one day, he said, you must do, you got a lot of newer people come in. You must do a lot of advertising. I said, we don't do any advertising. Billboards, no, we don't do any billboards, nothing like that. You know what, why people come into this church? Because they see you acting like the church outside these walls. That's why they're here. If anyone we should appreciate, it's not pastors, it ought to be you. It ought to be you. Because day after day, no, you're not perfect all the time. You don't have halo on shining all the time. But my word, let me tell you, there are more people coming into this church. And during our informational classes, they'll say, I knew so-and-so and so-and-so. And if so-and-so's coming, I wanted to come. So in other words, keep being that church, that brotherly love.
But he takes it a step further. He says, not only do we need to love other believers, but love total strangers. Now, he's talking about strangers who are within the church, people coming in the doors for the first time, still believers here, all right? And in this day, hospitality was a big virtue in the Jewish culture. Still is. Still is. Because, face it, they didn't have Motel 6s in every town or Hampton Inns in every town. You went to travel someplace, the inns were dirty and dangerous. We'll get to that when we get to the Advent story, right? But where did believers stay when they went from one town to another? They stayed with other believers. Other believers would open up their homes to them, and they stayed in those places. And so believers got to be known, Christian believers got to be known for showing this type of love, and others wanted to be a part of it. And that's why he goes on to say, he says, you never know who you're entertaining, you might be entertaining an angel unaware, all right? And, of course, when he says that, when he writes these words, they immediately go back to touch by an angel. No, they didn't go back to touch by an angel. We do that. They go back to the story of Abraham and Sarah. When those angels visit, and, and Abraham doesn't know that. And, in fact, one of them is the son of God. And they're visiting with him, and they go through the story telling Abraham and Sarah, you're going to be a father of many, you're going to have many descendants, and on and on it goes. In other words, you never know who God's going to connect you with, who God's going to send your way. But then he goes even further, takes it another step. Don't only love the strangers, love those in prison. Love those who are mistreated. Love the outcast. Love those who have really gotten a raw deal, Okay. What's he meaning by that? Well, think of the times they're, they're living in. This is a time when to follow Jesus Christ means a jail sentence, mostly. Can mean execution. It means your property is going to be confiscated, so you don't have anything left if you're in prison. And your family doesn't have anything left if they're outside of prison. And so, in other words, what he's saying is the church is growing. Care for one another. Care for those who have been mistreated. In fact, this phrase is interesting. The phrase actually has the meaning of... Put yourself in another person's shoes, all right? Put yourselves in another person's shoes. In other words, sympathy, compassion. And it's sympathy, the type we talked about before. It's not the sympathy like you drive by someone with a flat tire and you say, I feel sorry for that person. No, it's sympathy and compassion so that it drives you to turn around and come back and help that person. Writer Hebrews is saying this, don't look at those in prison or those who have been mistreated and just say, I feel sorry for you, I'll pray for you. You know, and prayer's a wonderful thing, but if it's just flippant like that, he's saying, do something about it. And so these folks back then came together. You know what they did? They opened up their homes for those who were homeless. They opened up their wallets and their pocketbooks for those who didn't have any support. They actually paid for the freedom of many of these believers to buy them out of prison. You remember how Jesus, though, he turned the tables on this? He said, not only could you be entertaining angels, but you might be looking at me as well over in Matthew. Turn over to Matthew 25. You've heard this scripture over and over again, but Matthew chapter 25. This is actually, it's interesting, because this is one of the statements that Jesus gave with regards there is a heaven and a hell, and this is judgment, and this is how it's going to be done. He says in verse 35 and following, For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited, invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And then the righteous are going to answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will reply, look at this, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did it also for me. You see, church, sometimes it might not be an angel you're entertaining. Sometimes the Lord might be happening to be in your presence through someone else or through someone he sent your way. So as John says, he says this, don't claim to love Jesus if you can't get along with your brother or sister in Christ, if you hate your brother or sister in Christ, don't come to the altar saying, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. You know, I'm glad we offer you plenty of opportunities around here to show our, our faith and show our faithfulness. So the wonderful thing about this taking care of others is you have opportunities. In fact, we're getting ready to enter that huge time of asking, okay? It's the season of ask, I call it, because over the next two months, 
you're going to see more ways to get connected with this church family if you've never done it before. To volunteer for ministries, to give to ministries, to serve in ministries. I mean, it's just over and over again. But that's what these first three verses of Hebrews are all about. That's what the Matthew passage is all about. All right, so we've covered quickly our relationship to others. Okay, now it's interesting. As you go from verse 4 in chapter 13, all of a sudden he's looking at the responsibility to ourselves. Or the responsibility for ourselves, if you would, the second part. And look where he chooses to begin. This ought to wake some of you up. Marriage should be honored by all. And the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Now there's something in my spirit that just says stop David and let there be a minute of silence there. As we think about that. He begins... In the bedroom. Where in the world is this guy going with a little bit of paper or scroll he still has left? What's the method to his madness? Here's the method. He begins in the bedroom because he's talking about personal purity now. He's just talked about loving others. All right? And if there is a perversion of love, it comes in the way of sexual immorality. These days, you don't even have to give me a head nod. All you got to do is turn on your television to see that perverted love, the world's definition of love, shows up in sexually oriented ways, right? Uh, If you're having problems with that, I can give you some some sitcoms to watch. I can give you some magazines to look over. All you guys do is hit the cover, all right? I can show you probably links, but, you, you know, if you're having a problem dealing with this one, Now, when the writer talks about marriage here, let me say this. When he begins in verse 4 with marriage, he is talking about marriage between a man and a woman. Okay? 30 years ago, when I began my ministry, I did not ever think I would have to even say something like that. Didn't contemplate that. But you see, what God designs, he defines. Okay? It's not up to the world to say, let me change the definition of marriage. It's not the world's job to do that. The world's not going to be answering to the world. The world's going to be answering to the Creator. All right? And so God designs it. He divines it. And guess what He says about it? In verse 4, He says it's honorable. It's honorable, much to the world's dismay today. What's He saying? He's saying, I've talked to you about love for others. Here's how you're going to show love for yourself. All right, and still be that that witness. God invented this thing called marriage. And even though the world is redefining it or telling us it isn't relevant anymore, God still says it's honorable. And he says if we want to keep it that way, then we're to honor it. We need to honor marriage and what comes with it as God honors it. And so he has this phrase in verse 4, keep the marriage bed pure. That is such a clean way of putting this for kids and everyone. Keep the marriage bed pure. And this is done when we realize that sex in marriage is blessed by God. Sex outside of marriage is not. Now, I want you to hear that generation culture today. You don't, don't shake your head. Don't even smile at me, okay? Sex in marriage is blessed by God within the boundaries, within the limits that he has defined. Sex outside of marriage is not. Now, now the truth is the church has been AWOL on this subject. We've actually talked about it before in here, okay? The church, though, loves it. It's pretty much buried its head in the sand when it comes to sex. As if nobody in church is involved with sex. How did we get here, okay? You know? And you know what culture has said since the church has gone AWOL on this? Culture has said, no problems. No problems. We'll take over the education. We'll teach your kids. We'll teach your grandkids. We'll, we'll even teach you. We'll, we'll get you immune to what you're watching. We'll get you sort of gradually taking this in so that it's no big deal. All right? And so, again, culture has pretty much done its job with that over and over again. Divorce is on the rise. Here are the signs. Divorce is on the rise. They're even among Christian believers. More fatherless homes than ever before in all races. Abortion is viewed by many as a form of birth control. 
More and more couples see nothing wrong with living together before marriage. I'll tell you, as a pastor, marrying Christian couples now, about 50-50, honestly, come to me who are already living together before they've ever, and they're, they belong to the church. They're in the church. Many today don't even view, I was talking with, with someone recently, they don't even view marriage as a priority. They had been living together, they're not members of the church, I talked to them a little bit, and uh, I, the question came up with, why aren't you married? He, and he looks at me and says, why? Well, why should I get married? I've got everything I need, we can do everything we want, you know, why get married? But in spite of everything culture says, guess what? The words in between these two covers are still standard. And they're still true. They haven't changed. They haven't changed. Now, don't think David Franks is sitting up here and standing up here and looking at you, thinking you, you're thinking I know more about you than I really do. I really don't. And I hope you're not doing the same thing to me. But the truth is, we're all sinners. We're all sinners in the eyes of God. But God designed with this in mind, with this subject in mind, his standards, his definitions, his boundaries. His standards on the purpose of and the place for sex. He created male and female and everything about us. He he made even that intimate relationship feel pleasurably good, physically speaking. All right? And he said it's good, but it is only good when it's within the boundaries of marriage. Outside of the boundaries, it's not good. So much so that he comes to this and he says... There are those who are adulterers, fornicators, those who are fornicators, those who have sex before you get married, outside of marriage, are sexually immoral, fall under the judgment of God. Now, wait a minute. Oh, me, I'm starting to sweat up here. Does this mean that anyone who's ever committed such a thing will be barred from heaven? Of course not. Of course not. Not if they have repented of those sins and asked God to forgive them for it. But what this verse is talking about is this. A person who is genuinely saved and is a Christ follower will not choose a lifestyle that God says, I don't approve of. I don't like what you're doing. A person who claims to be a Christian and chooses to continue, listen to this, I'm going to read this one, I don't want to mess this one up, chooses to continue living a lifestyle that God says is clearly wrong, hasn't been saved in the first place. Is David making that judgment call? No. God makes the judgment call, and I'll read it for you. 1 John chapter 3, verse 6. This is just one verse among many in this chapter that deal with it. So if you want the details, go back and read 1 John 3. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. You're sitting there saying to yourself exactly what I said when I read this, but I'm still a sinner. Yes, you're still a sinner, but there's a difference in the believing sinner and the one who isn't. The believing sinner comes to a point where you recognize this is sin, and so you say, I'm going to stop it. I'm not going to do it. You realize it's sin, and so you stop it. You know, you might fall into it. You might stumble again a day or two down the road or a month or two or a year or two. But your intention is, I know my father doesn't want me involved in this, so I'm stopping it. What this verse is talking about, where does the condemnation occur? It occurs with those who sin, they know it's sin, and they basically thumb their nose at God and say, I don't care what you think, I'm going to live the way I want to live. That's where the condemnation comes. That's where there will be those who get to heaven and think, Lord, Lord, and he'll look at us and get away from me. I don't know you. I don't know you. You see, when you become a believer, something cool happens. Christ moves in. The old you moves out. Christ, the Holy Spirit, moves into you. And therefore, it's not your conscience. All right? It's not Jiminy Cricket with your conscience saying, you know, let your conscience be a guy. No, it's not that. It's the Holy Spirit in you now. And you know what the Holy Spirit does to me? He tells me when I'm messing up. The things I used to get away with when I was younger and could tear up my brother's vehicles and not feel really any remorse, what about it? You know? Now I might feel some remorse, all right? Because the Holy Spirit's in me. He convicts me. He moves me. He motivates me to change. Before you came to Christ, you could do things and it didn't phase you. Now you come to Christ and even when you do those things that are wrong, something inside of you sort of, eh, and it just, it just, mm, and it just, you're thinking to yourself, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. 
saw a car commercial this week with one of those new electronic gadgets that's sort of an option in some vehicles. Uh, it lets you know when you are veering into another lane, all right? I've seen some of you drive. Some of you need this. Okay, option, okay? Never mind. I won't go any further than that. But it also lets you know if you're going off the road, you know, <laughs> I, you can tell usually when I go off the road, but you can, it, it beeps at you. The alarm sounds. This is exactly what Hebrews is saying. When you receive Christ as Lord and Savior, Holy Spirit moved into you, and now there's an alarm within you. And that's why you feel a little twinge when you do something and it's not right. Or you say something and it's not right. You shouldn't have said it. That's exactly what the Holy Spirit does within us. Holy Spirit is there to sound the alarm and let us know, Hey, David, we don't do this anymore. You, you used to be driving your vehicle and you'd veer into the other lane and really didn't know alarm sounded because I wasn't with you. But now the Holy Spirit looks at us and says, Hey, I'm sitting with you. I'm in the vehicle with you. I'm going to sound the alarm. So when you go where you shouldn't go, you're going to hear about it. You're going to feel the conviction. You're going to sense the movement. All right. We'll learn more about this, and we'll go further with this next week. But uh, it's one thing I've learned about over the years. It's something you guys have learned about as well as a Christian, as a believer. If I mess up, I don't want to stay messed up. This is what the writer of Hebrews is trying to bring us to a point where when we mess up, you don't want to stay there. All right? You fall in the mud hole, you don't want to stay in the mud. You want to move out. You want to get cleaned up. You want to get straightened up. And that's what God wants for you and me. Uh, anybody who's been to the movies recently, you know you will go for the movie, but it's quite often that it's getting further and further to the point where the previews last longer than the movie. All right? Uh, you know, you can go for two-hour movie and 30-minute previews. All right? Just about. But what are previews? Previews are things, if you've been like me, you'll sit there and you'll watch tons of previews and you'll, one or two will come up and you say, oh, I need to make plans for that. Now they come up, we're gonna, this movie comes out in 2019 or something like that, they're saying. So I want to make plans for that. I want to make plans for that. It's a preview of something you want to be a part of, a coming attraction. Well, guess what? Here's what the writer of Hebrews is saying in chapter 13. We are God's preview. We're the preview of everything that we've talked about before, of heaven and of running the race, and of this kingdom that is unshakable, and of this, this beautiful family, we're the preview. And we ought to be living our lives in such a way that the world around you, that God has connected you with, looks at you and says, I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of that coming attraction with them. Whew. Is that a responsibility? You bet it is, because next week he's going to get into isn't this amazing? His time and politics of all things. Okay? Don't worry. Bring your Pepto-Bismol and your Rolaids and your things like that. We'll get through that. Okay? But uh, it's amazing his timing. So, what kind of preview are you out there? What kind of preview are you? Here's what I want you to do. We're going to have some fun. Okay? Today, you're going to go to lunch or you're going to be around somebody tomorrow and uh, maybe you're in the break room or wherever you are and they're going to ask you how your weekend was. If they know you go to church, they're going to ask you, well, maybe, what the, how is church? What what the preacher preach about? <laughs> you just, whatever you're doing, if you're eating or something, you just say the sex and just keep on. Just keep, <laughs> don't even miss a beat, okay? And see if before the end of the work, work week, they don't say, what time service at your church on Sunday? <laughs> and you bring them along, okay? Let's pray. Father. Yeah, this is, this is not easy stuff to hear because when we talk sex or personal purity, Lord, we're talking about everything that we can do wrong, that we have a habit of saying, I don't need to change this. Father, how many people have we known that they had something in their lives and when they were confronted on it or held accountable, they said, I'm too old to change. I can't change. Well, Lord, that's not your people. That's not your people. That's not the way your people ought to be thinking. Your church, Lord, ought to be thinking that I can't change myself, but God can change me. I can't clean up my mess, but God can clean it up. I can't straighten out a crooked life that I've had, but God can certainly straighten it out. And Father, we'll give you thanks because you can and you do. 
And so, Lord, help us to those outside of this place that you connect us with, whether they be an angel or totally opposite. Lord, help us to be an ambassador for you, to be a preview for the coming attraction, for that kingdom which has no end. Father, if there's someone in this church right now today who's on the fence and they're sort of like, hmm, I don't know whether I want to be a part of this family or not. I don't want to know whether I want to be a Christ follower or not. Would you impress upon them what they've seen and heard in this place and what you put on their hearts to let them know that all they have to do is call on the name of Jesus and they're saved. To truly give their lives believing you died on a cross, rose from the grave. And they did it and you did it for them. And so Lord, in this place, may more and more come to that huge decision that they want to be a part of the family. And Lord, may we be that great testimony that's not perfect but that does shine for you that's our vision lord that's our vision in jesus name we pray and all god's people said as we're singing together i'm going to be standing right here if there's a decision you've made to follow him more closely i'd love to pray with you about it if there's a prayer need i'd love to pray with you about it so let's stand let's proclaim